Well, thank you, Dr. Charles, for those kind words. Good morning. I'm honored to have been asked to participate in the Career Foundation Global Forum, and I congratulate the Career Foundation for the idea of inviting world leaders in different fields to discuss the implications of increasing globalization. I stand here today, as you've already heard, as a representative of one of the world's great encyclopedic museums, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. I believe strongly that museums such as the Museum of Fine Arts have an important function and duty, that of helping to bring about world understanding through culture and through art. It was in fact for that reason that some of the earliest encyclopedic museums in Europe were established as part of the ideals of the Enlightenment. Great American museums such as the Museum of Fine Arts and the Metropolitan Museum in New York, both founded in 1870, by the way, followed on from museums in England such as the Ashmolean in Oxford and the British Museum, founded in the 17th and 18th centuries in the spirit of the Enlightenment. We are in the midst of one of the most dynamic times in the history of the Museum of Fine Arts. And all of us at the museum are particularly grateful today for the Career Foundation's generous support of the renovation of our career gallery. A renovation I'll be talking more about a little later. But more generally, the past 17 months, 17 months have seen unprecedented change in an institution that was already regarded as one of the premier museums of the world. November 2010 brought the opening of an, a new wing for Art of the Americas, designed by one of the world's great architects, Norman Foster, Foster and Partners of London, with installations masterly conceived and implemented by a museum-wide team. For the first time since the museum's founding, we display the art of all the Americas. North, Central, and South America in one wing to tell the story of what it means to be an American in the very broadest sense in the 21st century. The wing contains 53 galleries across four levels and gives visitors the opportunity to travel across continents and through time from 900 BC to the late 20th century. In each floor of the museum, core galleries contain iconic works representative of the period, complemented by smaller galleries on each side and in adjoining pavilion, pavilions. Works of art in all media, all media, and in unprecedented profusion are on display. Paintings, sculpture, furniture, decorative arts, works on paper, musical instruments, textiles, and costumes. Adjacent to the American wing is the Ruth J. and Carl Shapiro courtyard, bonding the art of the American's wing with the museum's historic building, creating a remarkable and beautiful equilibrium between old and new. And very rapidly, it's become one of the most popular party spaces and social spaces in the city of Boston. Well, uh, the opening of the Art of the Americas wing was followed quickly in September 2011 with the opening of the Lindy fam family wing for contemporary art. In this transformed wing, the contemporary art has its first permanent home at the MFA. The iconic modernist wing designed by I.M. Pei in the 1980s provides a superb setting for visitors to engage with contemporary culture in all its forms, through art, music, performances, readings, lectures, courses, and demonstrations by artists. There are seven new galleries that present innovative approaches to contemporary art within the context of our encyclopedic collections, a truly unique, unique experience among American museums. Among the new galleries is the first devoted to video and new media, as well as the first devoted to contemporary decorative arts, uh, which includes imposing a ceramic work, including this wonderful translated vase 
created in Korea by the artist Yi Soo Kyung in 2011. It's made of ceramic trash, epoxy, and 24 karat gold leaf. It's only one of two objects, by the way, by Yi in American museums. And truly, it's a bridge work connecting historic practice with modern experiment. In the Lindy family wing, there are more than 200 works on display, tripling the amount of contemporary art on view at the museum. Art walls in the wing were debut contemporary acquisitions, and the first uh, thematic installation of the walls on the first level and on the second level is Sparking Dialogue, which introduces electric lit text based works to promote discussion about contemporary culture. Very new for the Museum of Fine Art. The MFA's mission in undertaking these expansion and renovation projects has been to make its collections accessible to everyone, both our local community as well as the global community, to bring art and people together for the benefit of everyone. These major building projects have enabled the Museum of Fine Arts to rethink how our collections are displayed and how we will collect in the future, how we'll develop new audiences and how we create new relationships at home and around the world. To step back just a few years, the museum was founded in the late 19th century with the passing of an act by the Massachusetts State Legislature establishing a board of trustees of the MFA, and I quote, for the purpose of erecting a museum for the preservation and exhibition of works of art, making, maintaining, and establishing collections of such works, and of affording instruction in the fine art. With this legislative act, the museum was born on the principles of service to the citizenry of Boston. It was an organization founded, paid for, paid for, and its collection built by the people. Whereas European museums tend to be state funded, they're mostly, as they are mostly in Asia to this day, the museum receives very little, little limited income, very limited income from public sources. And so I think it's safe to say that the MFA is the world's largest privately funded art museum, a testament to individual American philanthropy. As a result, the museum has always had a strong public and civic ethos. We're open more than 60 hours a week, 361 days a year. The MFA boasts some of the longest hours of any art museum in the United States. Four days each year, as well as every end Wednesday evening, we open our doors to the community at no cost. We're also one of the most important New England's educational resources for schools. In both of our new wings, the Art of the Americas wing and the Lindy family wing, there are spaces dedicated specifically to education <coughs> and community, including new classrooms and seminar rooms, which provide much needed space for the museum's ever-expanding roster and art classes, programs and activities, all designed to increase our capacity to work with the tens of thousands of children who visit the museum each year. Interestingly, the past two years have seen private donors endow student membership programs for the neighboring states of Maine and New Hampshire, allowing every student in those states, from grade school through their college years, free admission to the museum in perpetuity the transformational gifts that will be felt by school children and students for generations to come. We look forward, with the help of donors we don't know yet, to expand the program to the rest of New England, to Rhode Island, to Connecticut, and most importantly, our home state, Massachusetts. Because of our truly global collection, we can also facilitate multi-generation cross-cultural education at a time when the world grows more connected by the day. 
We live in an era of rapidly, rapid technological advances that are dismantling the barriers between countries and cultures that have stood for thousands of years. Barriers due to basic geography, or much more complex barriers of national, social, and ethnic differences. So our vast collection uniquely positions the museum to provide context and insight as the forces of tech technology and globalization continue to make these historic separations between countries and cultures less evident. The Museum of Fine Arts houses a collection covering almost every continent of the globe, ranging from the ancient world to the present day. The collection of fine art and cultural objects spans eight distinct curatorial departments, uh, the art of the Americas, contemporary art, art of the ancient world, of Europe, textile and fashion arts, prints, drawings and photographs, musical instruments, and of course, the art of Asia, Oceania and Africa. The extraordinary breadth of these collections allow us to trace the development of the world's great civilizations and to see how, where we are today and who we are today is the result of interconnections that have taken place between people and ideas throughout history and across the world. Global engagement has always been part of the museum's core mission and purpose. The museum partnered with Harvard University, for instance, in the 1920s on an excavation in Egypt and North Africa, establishing one of the most important collections of Egyptian and Nubian art and culture in the world. Boston's close relationship with Japan established one of the finest collections of Japanese paintings in the world outside Japan. And today, that's led to the establishment of a long-term partnership with our sister museum in the city of Nagoya, to which we send a regular series of major exhibitions every year. Just a few days ago, the museum opened an exhibition at the Tokyo National Museum of masterpieces from our Japanese collection the finest inside anywhere outside of Japan. The exhibition included paintings such as the 8th century Hokkaido Kompon Mandara, the 12th and 13th century hand scrolls, Minister Kibi's travels to China, and the burning of the Sando Palace, as well as the sliding door paintings with monumental a dragon by the 18th century eccentric artist Soga Shohaku, a favorite of mine. Buddhist sculpture, swords, and textiles are also featured in the Tokyo exhibition. And selections will continue on to the Nagoya Boston Museum, Kyushu National Museum, and the Osaka City Museum in Bayonne. The MFA is also partnering with the Shanghai Museum in November this year, when it lends some of its great Sun painting masterpieces to an exhibition of Sun and Yuan paintings from four American museums. A commitment uh, to the growing diversity of the communities of people that make Massachusetts their home drove our participation in a more recent international endeavor. In December 2011, we were honored to join the state of Massachusetts Innovation Economy Mission to Brazil, led by Massachusetts Governor Devala Patrick. The museum was the first and only cultural organization to be asked to participate. The museum's goal for participation was to establish connections with key cultural and business institutions in Brazil at a time of unprecedented interest in that country, with its booming economy and upcoming role as the international host of both the World Cup and the Olympic Games. Here again, the museum is uniquely positioned to facilitate an international dialogue. The collections of the Art of the Americas will not only allow the visitor to trace the development of artistic traditions, but also the development of distinct cultural and national identities and the interaction between them and the rest of the world. Massachusetts is the home of the second largest population of Brazilians outside Brazil. And participation in this mission 
was a critical first step in allowing us to better serve this growing community in the years to come. I join you this morning as the museum looks to continue to grow its role as facilitator of cultural understanding with the renovation of galleries that have gone untouched at the museum for decades. Galleries that hold great treasures of, ancient, of the ancient world, European masterworks of the religions of Islam and Buddhism. They're all at the museum, but they badly need our attention. The first of these reimaginings is already underway as we completely transform the southwest wing of the building that holds our prized collections of Asia, Oceania, and Africa. Museums such as the Museum of Fine Arts can be vehicles of cultural diplomacy and cross-cultural understanding. As Asia continues its rapid development, presenting the Asian collections at our museum in an accessible way becomes increasingly important and significant. If the 21st century is indeed Asia's century, then it behooves us all to learn about and to try to understand its history and culture so that we may understand each other a little better and minimize causes of conflict. Our Asian gallery renovations started in December last year with the opening of the reinstalled and reinterpreted gallery for South and South uh, East Asian art and continues this year with a completely new gallery of Korean art thanks to the support of the Korean Foundation. The Korean collection of the museum is one of the earliest and best in the West and we're keen to share it with the rest of the world and to make Korean art better known and understood. Two works were linked to the Metropolitan Museum's Korean Renaissance exhibition in March 2009, and then another two to the National Museum of Korea's centenary exhibition in November 2009. Another work was led to the Guerrero Paintings Exhibition at the National Museum of Korea in October 2010, and we're delighted to be participating in the upcoming exhibition, Korean Art from American Collections, uh, there in June this year. As well as our Korean gallery renovations, a book is being planned of a hundred highlights of the MFA's Korean collection, and new acquisitions are being made, particularly in the area of Joseon screen paintings and contemporary ceramics. Like much of the MFA's East Asian collections, the Korean collection started with that famous trio of Bostonians who became enamored of the Far East traveled to Japan in the late 19th century. I mean, Edward Morse, Ernest Fenelosa, and Dr. William Sturgis Bigelow, famous names. Of the around a thousand objects in the Korean collections, 92 of them came from Edward Morse. He's better known for his collection of over 5,000 pieces of Japanese for pottery. But he also collected a group of early Korean South ceramics to show the influence, the cross-cultural influence of Korean pottery in Japan. 31 pieces of Korean art came to the museum from Bigelow, many of them collected in Japan. These included fine Buddhist paintings, literati paintings, metalworks, ceramics, and lacquer. Their friend and advisor, Okapura Tenshin, became curator of the museum in 1904 and established a special Korean pottery fund through which he purchased celadons and also bronze mirrors. The other great collection of Korean art came to the museum in 1950 as a request from Charles Bain Hoyt and consisted of wonderful early pottery, various celadons and metalwork, and Joe Song Whereas, also. In common with some other donors to the MFA in the first half of the 20th century, Hope Point stated that he did not want his collection to travel. 
which has meant that it has remained relatively unknown outside the United States. It is, however, unparalleled in, in, in America, and perhaps only rivaled in the West by the Gompers collection of the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, England. The masterpieces of the museum collection mainly date from the Guerrero dynasty, a period when the Buddhist church was predominant and many works of art were produced for temples and for private devotion, as well as uh, for the increased merit. It was also a period of splendor that the Guerrero court at Gai Sion, where elegant silver, bronze, and cylinder words were used at a table. Of the works of art made for Buddhist use, the most magnificent in the MFA's collection is the 14th century painting of the Vairocana Buddha teaching the Sutra perfect enlightenment. This painting, as well as the silver year of the Cellar of Vars, will form the sum of the stars in our new, new Korean gallery opening in Boston on the 15th of November this year. The opening will be followed by our Korea Foundation Day on November the 16th, when we'll be presenting Korean films, music, food, and talks. Museums are not just about the past, or even the past and the present. They're also about the future. It was a Korean, the well-known father of video art, Nam Jun Paik, who famously said, the future is now. I take this to mean that we are creating the future as we speak. Museums are for future generations as yet unborn, as well as for us. So let's try to create museums that are innovative, exciting, and accessible, and which also contribute to a better, more tolerant future for the world. My thanks to our hosts and benefactors from the Career Foundation, and I thank each one of you for your presence here today. And I'd be delighted to take a few questions.